All right, we are live. Give a couple seconds for people to to join in. They can watch the reruns if it fails, right? Yes, they can. If you send me the link, I can, I can, well. Oh yeah, here we go. Eventually, I can put it up on my my thing too. Just save me a blog post. All right, we will go ahead and get started. I know people are coming in. So uh, let me do one more thing here. All right, so my guest probably needs no introduction, but I will do it anyway. <laughs> um, so honored to have Dr. Craig Keener here tonight. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and do a brief introduction because his whole bio is just too long to read. <laughs> um, and then I'll have him share share some more stuff from there on out. Um, so before coming to, to Asbury in July, 2011, uh, Dr. Keener was professor of New Testament at Palmer Theological Seminary of Eastern University, where you taught for about, I guess, 15 years. Um, and then before that, you were, you were a professor at Hood Theological Seminary. I think I have some friends who were at a different version of that. <laughs> um, you've authored 28 books, six of which have won book awards in Christianity Today, of which altogether more than one million copies are in circulation. Uh, your recent books, you know, commentaries on Galatians, which I've, I've read and used several times, uh, Spirit Hermeneutics, The Mind of the Spirit, Paul's Approach to Transform Thinking, um, Gospel of John Commentary. You published more than 70 academic articles and more than 170 popular ones. Uh, and then you're also the editor, or at least you were the editor for the Bulletin for Biblical Research. I don't know if you're, are you still there? No, this is an old, an old CD. Oh, <laughs> gotcha. And then also, um, as we will get into, uh, you're married to Medin Mus Musunga, is that how you say it? Musunga Kenner, and who she holds a PhD from the University of Paris. Um, she was a refugee for 18 months in her nation of Congo, and their story is well told in this book, which we, we will get into, um, called Impossible Love. Um, and you were ordained in an African-American denomination in 1991, and for roughly a decade, uh, before m moving to uh, Wilmore, you're one of the associate ministers, associate ministers in an African American uh, megachurch in Philadelphia. And then in recent years, you've taught, I mean, everywhere, I guess, Africa, Asia, Latin America, um, and, you know, obviously in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even read the whole resume. So <laughs> let me say this real quick. Um, for those that are new to the channel, make sure you go ahead and subscribe. Make sure you hit the notification bell so you get notified every time we re release new content or have amazing guests such as the one we have tonight. Um, so I, I, I was trying to halfway be creative, but also just try to encapsulate in some way the, the breadth of your work, which is hard to do. Um, so I called it Miracles, um, Marriage and Mission. And... That's the pastor and me with the alliteration. So, <laughs> um, 
because you and your wife's testimony needs to be told probably now more than ever. Um, also, I've been teaching for years myself about the kingdom. That was before I ever knew what apologetics was. That's that's what I taught because that's what I knew. And that was Jesus's primary message as well. Um, so we'll get into that when we talk about mission. And I want to start, though, uh, with some kind of, I guess, marital thoughts. And your bio, as I just read it in this incredible book, Impossible Love, um, which I appreciate you giving me, uh, you know, when we when we saw each other a couple years ago, um, it highlights your relationship and actually what that relationship is on the heels of, if you if you want to share that. Um, and I myself am in a, a you know, interracial marriage and we didn't have to fight through war in Africa, but <laughs> it has its own struggles from time to time. So I do want to get into that, but I, I first want to kind of get your, your, your story on how you became a believer in the first place. Cause I believe you, you were an atheist, uh, and you know, pretty comfortable in that and then tell the rest. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know how comfortable I was, but I was, okay. I was pretty convinced. Um, I, I guess I was comfortable at the beginning, and and then when I started thinking through the implications of what it meant, it became increasingly uncomfortable because, um, on atheistic, on atheistic assumptions, there's no life and uh, no no meaning in life and. Yeah, no ultimate objective, and certainly no immortality or anything like that. So, um, I guess when I was thirteen, I started reading Plato, mm. and at thirteen, <laughs> yeah, well, in English though it was English translation. But I, <laughs> what Plato did, his arguments weren't convincing, but the questions that he raised about the immortality of the soul and existence and so on. And at the same time, I was you know, reading a book on infinity and, and you know, thinking about, it got me thinking about eternal questions and realizing that my own existence as a sentient being was an infinitesimal improbability. And I, on, on, my, on my worldview, I came from nowhere and I was going to nowhere. And, and it's kind of a depressing worldview, but but Plato got me thinking about well maybe maybe there's a different approach. And even though his approach wasn't convincing, um, I started saying if there's a god or some some deity out there or something infinite that happens to care about us, please uh, let me know. <laughs> but. I didn't know how to have access to that deity. If such a deity existed, um, why would it be interested in me uh, unless it was absolutely loving? And so to have something infinite that was also absolutely loving that would care about us, that was like uh, the best of all possible worlds, but it was just too unbelievably good to, to believe. And then one day I ran into some some Christians who were out witnessing on the street, and I argued with them for about 45 minutes. They they presented to me how to be saved, how to be made right with God, because Jesus died for me and rose again. And I didn't want to be disrespectful, but I, I mean, I made fun of Christians sometimes, but I didn't want to be disrespectful to them. And then... Um, I hit them though with what I thought was the ultimate question. I said, if there's a God, where did the dinosaur bones come from? If you ask a stupid question, you get a stupid answer. They weren't trained in paleontology. Obviously, they also were not trained in apologetics. Yeah. They gave me the, the one answer that came to their mind, they said the devil put them there, which is a really stupid answer. But anyway, uh, I said, okay, you guys, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. And one of them called out after me, well, you know, you're hardening your heart. And as you continue to harden your heart, you're going to become incapable of repentance and you will burn forever in hell. So mm -hmm. I know this is uh, partly an apologetics uh, podcast or broadcast. Uh, yeah. That's not a good way to do apologetics. No. <laughs> it's, not, it's not called friendship evangelism, you know. Right. But in any case, um, I walked home, you know, I, I blew them off, but 
I felt something. I studied different religions, but I had this time I was feeling something like I'd never felt before. Hmm. And you know, I got home. I was struggling with this, but finally, I was so overwhelmed by the presence of God, and there was no there was no questioning. That's what this was. Finally, I said, "Okay, God, I don't understand what Jesus dying for me or rising from the dead, how that makes me right with you." But if that's what you say, I'll believe it. But God, I don't know how to be made right with you. I don't know how to be saved. So if you want to save me, you're going to have to do it yourself. And all of a sudden, I felt something rushing through my body like I'd never felt before. I jumped up, scared out of my mind. But that was the beginning of my Christian life. I, I'd always said, if I ever believed there was a God, I would live like it. Mm. I did that was one of my arguments against believing what the Christians were saying was because it seemed to me like they didn't live like they took it seriously. If we really believe that, that God made us and that there's a purpose for us, we should give God everything. Yeah. Well said. I've done um, a couple lives recent in recent months on orthopraxy specifically because of that, where you know, we, so I, I, some of the other things I do, I do when I can, uh, prison ministry and, uh, you know, I'm in the inner city and I do a lot of ministry here and I've been in youth ministry. And so it's hard to convince people of your words, if your actions, like you said, aren't, aren't matching. And if our orthopraxy doesn't match our orthodoxy, regardless of how many verses we can quote, it kind of falls on deaf ears. So I really appreciate, um, I really appreciate that. And, and even, even, your struggle with maybe even not coming to Christ prior to that because of what you saw out of people is, is kind of a message that we all need to hear and take. So I appreciate that. It wasn't everybody. There were a handful of people whom I both knew were Christians and they were nice. Mm. Um, then there were other people who really were Christians, but they didn't tell me they were Christians. And so I had no <laughs> idea. Uh, so I just kind of lumped everybody together. Gotcha. Okay. Well, um, I'm glad that you had that experience because we have all benefited from your work since then. Um, so let's, let's start here. <clears throat> um, in this book that I kind of referenced before, everybody, if you haven't got it, go get this. It's, it's, I don't remember when it came out, but um, Impossible Love. And we don't have to recount the whole story, but it does detail the kind of remarkable you know, relationship you have with your with your wife and how that came to be. Um, well, kind of tell us how it came to be, the brief version. And then the real question I want to ask is how can society currently use such a testimony or, or benefit, from, benefit from such a testimony to heal and to become united, um, you know, especially in the church? Yeah. Oh, there's a whole bunch there that we could we could mm -hmm. talk about, but when I met Medine, uh, she was an exchange student from France. She's she's from Congo, Brazzaville in Central Africa, but she was doing her PhD in France. She was doing her PhD dissertation on African-American women after reconstruction. So she came to the US to study Americans and she ended up getting one, that's the short version. But um, <laughs> we, um, we met through uh, campus ministry at Duke University, where I was doing my PhD. Ah, and she was lovely, but uh, I should skip skip all that. Your heroes don't need to know that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we, um, we, 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 you know, just making conversation, I, I happened to mention uh, the father of a, a friend of mine. He was he was a missionary in Congo, and she said, "Oh yeah, he's good friends with my father." Now, I mean, of course, there's millions of people in <laughs> Central Africa, but anyway, uh, she happened to know him, and so we we ended up becoming really good friends. And I knew she was fired up for the Lord, so I would I would be sharing Christ with somebody on campus, and they'd say, "Oh yeah, Medine Musunga told me the same thing." So I said, "Okay, she's sharing her faith." We were part of a Bible study group together sometimes, and, and then she went back. She was she was just in the U.S. for a year. She went back to France to work on her, uh, finish her doctorate, and we kept 
we kept corresponding over the years. I helped her some with some of her research. She needed some things from the library in the US. Mm -hmm. And then she went back to Congo and she was caught up in a civil war there. Oh. And um, to make a long story short, and I'm kind of squeezing together a couple of different civil wars, mm. but she found herself, um, She, I mean, we liked each other, but we were both shy. And I didn't, I felt like to really understand me, I needed a wife who was called the ministry, had the same passion that I did. Um, but we, when I say ministry, I mean it in a broad sense. And she thought it had to mean pastor or missionary, and she wasn't called to be a pastor or missionary. So she, uh, she said, well, she wasn't called. So reluctantly, we decided we better cool it before our feelings got more involved. And so we determined to just stay friends, pray for each other, that we'd find the right spouse and so on. She married a guy in Congo. But unfortunately, again, to make a long story short, um, soon after the marriage, like a month in, she found out that he was actually, well, he started abusing her. Um, she didn't actually find out till later that he was married to somebody else when he married her. It was bigamy. He'd sang for monogamy, but um, he strangled her and abandoned her during the, uh, the war. So she was left pregnant, running as a war refugee for life during the war. And I don't know if you want me to go into detail about the war or just skip ahead to... Yeah, we can skip ahead. Y'all go get the book though, seriously. <laughs> okay. So we anyway, we got married. Right. That's why we're both named Keener at the end. So. <laughs> I picked up on that. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the cover of the book is kind of a spoiler, but anyway. Yeah. Well, no, so that's the setup. And so what can, you know, without telling the whole book right now, based on your experience, you all's experience and your experience in not just in Africa, but also, you know, if, if people know your other story of um, the struggles you had before you were be going to get your PhD and then you ended up with this, um, this neighborhood and with this black family and then in their church and with all of those experiences, combine what can you share that might help people on whatever side of the equation they are may, maybe find ways to um to heal with their brothers and sisters on the other side or or get some unity going yeah i, I mean i i really despised overt racists but i i didn't know that there was more to it than that um mm. i think back in the in the late 80s Sometimes I'd hear white friends make racist remarks and I kind of like, oh, I can't believe they said that. And they're just gonna go over my head. I just kind of tried to ignore it. I just like, that was just a one-off. That's that's just weird. Right. But then um, when this African-American family, after I'd been through a deep tragedy, when they took me in, uh, I mean, not, physically into the residence, but I, I, I was in their neighborhood. They kind of adopted me into the family. And as they were conversing around each other about the, you know, the things that they, they went through on a regular basis. And then at Duke, when I was taking my classes and I became involved with an African-American campus ministry there and the things that I heard the students, I mean, it wasn't like they were trying to convince me of something. They were just talking to each other about what happened to them during the day, mm. kind of racist experiences that some of them had. It was, it was startling to me. And I realized, my goodness, I thought I was an educated person. And here I am living in this country. I have friends who are African-American. But I was totally oblivious to what they went through because mm. I wasn't going through it. I didn't see it. Mm. But once once the, you know my attention was drawn to it, I could I could see it a lot more clearly. But after after one occasion where some of the students were talking with each other about some of these things, uh, after the other students left, I asked Arthur, who had started the, the group this kind of stuff doesn't happen often, does it? And he looked at me like, 
uh, this naive white guy, <laughs> he took me aside and said, you know, my first English class at Duke, the professor at the end of class called me aside. I was the only person there. And the professor said, this was the first day of class, you're not going to pass this class. So you may as well drop it now. And if you tell anybody I told you this, it'll be your word against mine. Oh. I was horrified. Um, you know, I'm not saying, I, I don't know what it's like there now, but this was like 19, uh, late, late 1980s, I think, when, when Arthur told me this. By the way, Arthur did stay in the class. He, he got an A in the class, mm -hmm. and he's, he's a medical doctor now, so he... he uh, yeah. Glad to hear that. <laughs> but, but I eventually became part of an African-American church, and uh -huh. some of the people in the church, I mean, they had been through sit-ins, in Greensboro, North Carolina, and things like that, in an earlier day, and the grace that they showed me to welcoming me there, I learned. I learned a lot of grace from that, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of grace toward brothers and sisters in Christ, and towards slow white people who are slow to to catch on to the reality of racism, just because they don't experience it, they don't think it's going on. Uh, but uh, and you want me to talk about uh, implications for? Yeah, if there's any kind of insight you can give us, I mean, obviously this is a is a bit of a bit of a device of time <laughs> to say the least. Is there just well, I think you kind of gave part of it because one thing I always say is the shortest distance between two people is a conversation. Right. So we have a lot of I'm going to yell from this side and you're going to yell from this side and we don't really listen. No one's listening. Yeah. And even when I when I go and serve the homeless or something like that for those moments you enter into their reality or their pain in some cases and so that's when you really learn i mean the books can teach you some stuff but they really can't yeah. until you get your boots on the ground you don't really get to learn yeah. and, and and so the firsthand experience you were able to experience in those moments and in that church that's i mean yeah. based on what i see that that that's what kind of did it for you and yeah, I mean, yeah listening uh, and really hearing other people's experience and not assuming that just because it's not yours doesn't mean it's not somebody else's. That same thing comes up with miracles. Like somebody says, well, I haven't seen one. Right. <laughs> well, Because it's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, so many things we have to depend on other people's testimony for. Yeah. And, you know, later, you know, living in an African-American neighborhood and, and uh, for a number of years teaching in an African-American school, just the things that I saw, the things that I heard from my students and, and from my friends. Mm. When you're in a friendship, and these are your brothers and sisters in Christ, if Jesus is really Lord of our life, then that's the ultimate, uh, that's the ultimate determinant, that's, that's, the, that's the ultimate identity that we, we have to claim. And if Jesus is Lord of our life, then that means that there's nothing closer to us than our brothers and sisters. And it can't be based on race or something else. I mean, the differences are there, but those are differences we can celebrate, we can learn from and, and not, not be divided by. When Medina and I married, uh, see, I was expecting my wife was gonna be African-American because I lived in the African-American community and, I, and I, I felt so at home there. And with Medine, you know, our cultures were so completely different. <laughs> I was scared of that, you know, but uh, even after we got married, so I would say, je t'aime, I love you. And she would say, and I thought she would say, moi aussi, I love you too. But instead she would say, um, uh, merci, thank you. Oh. And, and I was like, oh, she doesn't love me. But <laughs> it was a completely cultural thing that's, that was the normal way in her culture to respond to that statement. And so, you know, it took us a while to make those adjustments. So learning, learning culture is really important. Learning people's background is really important. It's part of what it means to get to know them. And the, the, the kind of divisions in her country were between regions. So 
she says that her civil war, the civil war in her country was, you know, racism based, but not on skin color. It was based on ethnicity in a different way. Mm. But in the U.S., the history of racism, I mean, it goes right back to the beginning. It's just, and and people who don't see it, it's just because they choose not to see it. I mean, it's, it's. Amen to that. <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad you said that. We've been talking a lot about that here and different guests, but I appreciate, I appreciate you saying that. And, and especially coming from a theological as well as a cultural perspective to be able to say, you know, from your, from your seat, that it's real. I, I, I struggle. I'm not, I'm cause I think sometimes when I say it to people or we say it to people, they think we're blaming them for it. And that's not the case. We're simply saying this is a actual thing. It's a real thing. <laughs> I'm not saying who did it. I mean, we can talk about that, but I'm not saying you did it. <laughs> so yeah, like you said, if you don't see it, it's cause you choose not to. Where, where I was living at the time, there were like two sides. There was the white side and the black side. And the white side had oppressed the black side. The black side had never oppressed the white side. Not to say that they, you know, some of them wouldn't have if they could have, but they'd never been in that position. So it was like clear which side was the side of justice. Now, it didn't mean that all white people were, you know, deliberately doing this, but insofar as you had to choose one side or the other, the black side was the right side. All right. <laughs> there you have it, everyone. <laughs> well, I want to shift gears a bit because um, there's another part is actually a part of both of your stories, but but it's also a very contentious issue uh, in the church about how we should best think about this. And I, I know you've written about it. I know, you, I know you've done some videos on this. Um, and so in Impossible Love, you kind of detail, um, you know, your um, your wife, your first wife and the situation that happened there. And um, so I want to kind of, if you want to tell that story, you can, or some of it, but the main question I want to ask is what are your thoughts on how we should think about marriage? Well, specifically divorce. Um, mm -hmm. Does God forgive, you know, in what situations does he forgive? I know this is a long sticky topic, but if you can just help us a little bit. Yeah, it's a long, it's a long topic. I should say in the last part, cause you mentioned a theologian perspective, Perspective or a theological perspective that on in the New Testament we have a whole lot about different ethnicity. I mean, it's not so much about what we call race in light of the history of this country, but the Jewish Gentile divide is all over the place. Jewish Samaritan divide, and the 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 church had to struggle with that, especially in the 50s of the first century. Well, that's when the circumcision issue became big, but even even earlier than that. Yeah. So. There, there are plenty of biblical theological resources for dealing with that. Now, for dealing with um, the divorce issue, obviously, there are plenty of theological uh, yeah. resources for dealing with that in the Bible, too. So uh, you wanted the concise answer. The concise answer about divorce is it's bad. Okay, that's yes. the concise answer. Uh, and, and I can tell my story, too, but uh, let me start with the biblical uh, you want me to do, start with the biblical or start with my story? Uh, start with your story. I, I think that'll help give us an insight. And then, yeah. Okay. Um, I got married to one of my classmates from, from Bible college. And, you know, we, we prayed together. We studied the Bible together. It seemed like a pretty happy marriage. Um, I was away for a couple months for my ministry practicum in seminary. And when I came back, things were a little bit different. So we had to we had to work on it hard. I, I didn't understand at first what was going on, but I, I later found out um, my wife was having an affair with her best friend's husband. And she told me she was gonna leave me and she was gonna marry him after he divorced his wife. And so she was gonna divorce me so she could marry him. And I fought the divorce for a couple of years, hoping that she would come back. And she never did. So that's one reason it was like 15 years after after she left before I remarried. And that's one reason Medina and I are so old. We'd be 15 years younger. At least we, we've been married a lot earlier. Yeah. Uh, 
I just was so brokenhearted. I, 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 it was hard to trust again. So uh, going, going to the, the biblical material, I had, I had come to a lot of these conclusions before I went through that, but I actually became much more against divorce afterwards because I understood why God doesn't like it. It really, it hurts people, it wounds people. It betrayed trust is something God never meant for us to have to go through, whether as spouses or as children or, or whatever. So in, in Jesus' day, there were, uh, among the Pharisees, there were two main schools of thought, the school of Shammai, the school of Hillel. And they both looked at this passage in Deuteronomy 24 that says if a man is going to divorce his wife, because in that culture only the man could do it, um, if a man's going to divorce his wife, he has to give her a certificate of divorce so that you know she'll be free to marry somebody else. And the school of Shammai said he can divorce her if she's unfaithful to him sexually. The school of Hillel said he can divorce her if she burns the toast whatever he wants to. They weren't recommending divorce, but they right. said it's the husband's right to do it. And then they, the, you know, the Pharisees asked Jesus, well, uh, well, where do you come down in this? And Jesus came down a lot closer to the side of Shammai saying, uh, and we have this in, in Matthew 5, 32 and 19, uh, except for the cause of immorality. That's, you know, he makes that the exception. Now, in Mark, the exception isn't mentioned in Mark 10, and it's not mentioned in Luke 16, 18, but it is mentioned in Matthew twice. And also Paul, uh, when the issue comes up in the church in Corinth, and probably a, a bunch of people were divorced before they even became Christians in Corinth. It was very widespread in Corinth. Uh, and in Corinth, either spouse could divorce the other. Yeah. So Paul's response to that was, for, for those who wanted to divorce, saying, you know, we're spiritually incompatible, or, you know, my, my spouse isn't saved, let me get a divorce. Paul says, no, uh, that's not grounds for divorce. Here's what Jesus said, and he quotes Jesus. And then he says, but here's what I say. Because he recognizes Jesus was dealing with the general principle. He wasn't dealing with every kind of situation. So he specifies another exception. He says, if the unbelieving leaves you, the believer isn't under bondage in such cases. That was the exact language of ancient divorce contracts for freedom to remarry. So Jesus is saying, you know, in the case, well, Jesus and Matthew says in the case of adultery, uh, Paul qualifies Jesus' uh, teaching in the case of abandonment. I think that if we follow the principle, uh, what makes both of those exceptions is th the believer doesn't, dump the uh the spouse you know we, we we need to be faithful to our marriage but in in the cases of adultery and abandonment we're talking about the spouse breaking the marriage so the issue is don't break up your marriage yeah try to make your marriage work but if it's broken from the other side god isn't holding people accountable for that and also it seems to me there's an element of hyperbole in what Jesus says, because to say that a person who uh, who divorces their spouse and marries another is committing adultery. When they speak of adultery, literally, uh, a person is married to this person and they sleep with somebody else, that's adultery. So if they divorce the person and sleep with somebody else or, or marry somebody else, for that to be adultery, what Jesus is saying is the divorce isn't valid in God's sight. You're still married to the original spouse. But I take that to be hyperbole. Uh, hy hyperbole is rhetorical overstatement. Be uh, I take it that way because of the exceptions. Because if you've got an innocent party regarding the divorce, <laughs> if, if the innocent party isn't married to the guilty party, the guilty party can't still be married to the innocent party either. Right. And also, um, Jesus often uses hyperbole and even uses it in the same context. So in Matthew 5.32, the context right before that, if anyone looks on a woman to lust after her, he's committed adultery with her in his heart. Wow. 
so there he also speaks of adultery in a, in a figurative sense. And he gives a solution to it there. And the solution to it is, if your eye causes you to stumble, rip it out. <laughs> but most people, most people I, I know, I'm pretty sure they've never committed lust because they still have their eyeballs. <laughs> no, we, we, we understand that that's rhetorical overstatement. Yeah. The very next passage where he, he also uses adultery figuratively, he does the same thing. But the point of hyperbole, though, isn't to say, oh, that's just hyperbole, forget it. The point of hyperbole is to drive home the point. Yeah. The point is be faithful to your marriage. Yeah. And um, it, he, also when Jesus says to the, the woman who's been married multiple times in John mm -hmm. 4, he doesn't say, well, you were, you were married to uh, one guy and you've been sleeping with five guys since then. He says, no, you were married five times mm -hmm. and you're not married to the guy with whom you're living now. Mm -hmm. So that, you, you know, <laughs> If, if that's a literal, then the other has to be hyperbole. And, mm -hmm. and uh, there's also another exception passage in, in 1 Corinthians 7, but rather than, than going into detail and all that, because I'm probably taking too long already, just to say that, um, that the, the, kind of, the kind of exceptions, adultery, abandonment, I think abuse would be the same kind of category. But we need, we need to do our best to make our marriages work. But yeah. It takes two people to make it work. Yeah. Well, we have a question kind yeah. of, um, so if you can help us clarify, are you making a differenti differentiation between a principle and a rule? Or or is that some, like, is that just semantics? But you sounds um, like you're saying. I wasn't making a distinction like that, but it's a, it's a legitimate distinction to make. Uh, the, the principle, you have to think about how it applies in particular situations. Um, whereas a rule, you just follow it no matter what. So I, I think, uh, yeah, I think what we have is a principle, but it's it's a principle that always applies, be faithful to your marriage. But the part about um, remarriage being adultery, that is, I think that's a um, rhetorical overstatement. Even, even even in the context of that in Mark 10, where he doesn't mention you know, adultery as, as grounds, he just makes a general statement. He says, what God has joined together, let no one put asunder. He doesn't say that if you try to put it asunder, it's still, you're still married. He says, don't do it. And so, you know, all these other lines of evidence suggest that that one statement is really, he's using hyperbole, like, camel going through the eye of a needle, moving mountains, and uh, squeezing a camel. Uh, uh, I, yeah, that, that's uh, squeezing a camel through the eye of a needle. That's where you get camel meal tea. Um, <laughs> but, uh, the, other, the other camel when straining out a, a gnat and swallowing a camel, mm. uh, Matthew 23, 24. And just, he uses hyperbole all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, fair points. And I think so regardless of how everybody's take on it is, I, I do think there's at least some reason to believe that the innocent party, especially in a, in a situation of infidelity or, or abuse, would not be held accountable for that, um, at least not to that degree. Uh, OK, I know it's a difficult topic. We're not going to cover it all tonight and get it, get it all squared away. But I want to shift to to miracles, and you've done a lot of work on on this, on everything, really. And, I, and one thing I appreciate is how you continually um, connect the dots between the historical and the cultural, you know, background that's prevalent um, and and evidence in the text with the the work of the Holy Spirit uh, in what took place and in and why it took place. And so, what do you think some people may miss? if they focus too much on the cultural or the contextual background or too much on the spiritual component and, and um, why is it important not to divorce the two? No pun intended. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we need both. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the, yep. beginning of the knowledge. So we need to start from the right groundwork, which I wasn't doing as an atheist, but you know, as a Christian, 
I want to read the Bible with the fear of the Lord. So I'm not reading my own views into it. Right. I'm trying to find what's what's actually there, you know, working through it over and over again. If there are figures of speech, I want to recognize those figures of speech. If there are different um, literary types, different genres, mm. uh, and, and different principles for reading this this kind of writing or that kind of writing, I want to do that just like I would do in, in other literature. Um, God inspired these people to write these things, but he didn't use like a, a cosmic wind, you know, that's <laughs> translinguistic. He, he does it in Hebrew and in Greek. You know, he does it in specific languages. He, he does it with the imagery of specific cultures, mm. specific historical settings. Jesus became flesh a, as a child in, in, uh, in Bethlehem. And I grew up in Nazareth. You know, th these are real historical events. And because God gave it to us concretely, we can learn from it for our own concrete settings mm. rather than, you know, just, uh, again, as if, as if he spoke in some cosmic language that everybody understands. You know, the spirit can speak to our hearts that way. Mm -hmm. But you can't have a writing that way. The Bible is inspired writing. So it's inspired. We want to hear what the spirit is saying through it. It's also writing. So we want to take into account the kind of things we need to take into account with writing. I, with my science background, I, I wasn't, um, I wasn't quite ready for that. But as I read the Bible over and over again, I found out if you read 40 chapters of the Bible a day, you can get through the New Testament every week or through the Bible every month. Wow. Um, but as I immersed myself in it over and over and over again, I began to see how, how the things fit together. You, you can have somebody who can be very good at studying it on the human level, though, and they're not really listening for God's voice in it. They're not receiving that would be by What? That would be Bart Ehrman. Well, <laughs> be a lot of people. Actually, I think there are a lot of Christian scholars who do yeah. that. I mean, you can you can um, exegete with the Greek and the Hebrew and do all those things. And still, if you don't approach it in faith, you don't appropriate it, say, I believe this. I want to implement this in my life. Uh, Lord, help me implement this in my life then you're not really hearing God's voice there. On the other hand, we have a lot of people who will try to hear God's voice in the text, yeah. but they're hearing a reflection of their own voice, yeah. they're reading their own perspectives into it, they're not reading in context and so on. When I was a really young Christian, I, I was taking Latin and <clears throat> I was supposed to be translating Caesar's Gallic War but I just become a Christian, and I really did not want to read Caesar. I wanted to read just the Bible. So on my way home from Latin, I flipped open the Bible and stuck my finger down, hoping it, I would hit a verse saying, "Forsake all and follow me," and I could just read my Bible. Instead, it was in Luke twenty. It said, "Render to Caesar what is Caesar's." Wow. <laughs> So I had to, I had to do my, I had to do my Latin homework, but, <laughs> which was good for me. But um, it, you know, God can speak through a scripture out of context, just like He can speak through a bird or a tree or a donkey, whatever He wants to speak through. But imagine if I had gone around to all the churches saying, "God showed me that the meaning of this text is we should translate Caesar." Well, that's not the meaning of the text. Right. The meaning of the text is what it means in its context. <laughs> and Man, you're speaking my language. I <laughs> I just released a video on Monday, actually, uh, dealing with hermeneutics. It's basically like an introductory course on hermeneutics. And my kind of tagline over this last year has become, the text can never mean what it never meant. Right. And so if you don't read it, my question to some people is always, you know, if it's really hyper charismatic, let's say the Lord told me the Lord. Told me. Well, if you don't know what he's already said, then how do you know what he's telling you? Because he won't contradict himself. Yeah. But the things that I'm sometimes hearing, they're contradictory because I do read the scripture. And so 
um, even in your even in your book, you talked about some of the times God God was speaking to you, but it, it never contradicted the authority of Scripture. And so, I think that's the good proof test for all of us. Yeah. Um, yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. So, this may be a, a difficult question, or maybe it's an easy question. I don't know. And we talk about miracles, and, and I've, I've done a lot of work on you know resurrection, as have a lot of people. Um, if you could say there's one miracle that almost no one can refute in the scholarly world, and I, I don't mean say that it didn't happen, but I mean provide kind of evidentiary support against the probability of what you're claiming, um, what would you, what might you say? I'd say the resurrection. I mean, All right. <laughs> well, of course, you've got people who, who don't believe it, but it's not because the evidence isn't there. Right. No, I... Um, I remember the first, I think it was the first class in my master's in apologetics, uh, it was Gary Habermas was the teacher. And um, yeah, I mean, obviously no one's done more work on the resurrection than than him. Um, and if it's not true, he's been wasting his life for 40 years or 30 years or whatever it is. Well, if it's not true, all of us were giving our lives yeah. for Christ. <laughs> But um, but we're convinced it is true. That uh, I, and I think I see Mike Mike Lacona's uh, resurrection book on your shelf behind behind yep. you. Yep, yep, it's over there. Yep. But I, uh, there's another book I want to ask you about. Oh, here. We go. So this book, I oh, love this. I know that book. <laughs> yes, I think you do. I love this book. If y'all haven't read this book, please go read this book. Um, I've recommended it to so many people because um, whenever people, especially you know, you talk about. Uh, at the beginning, you were talking about, it, does this happen often? And you're asking your the black friends, um, <clears throat> is that typical? So one thing is typical for me and a lot of the people in the comment section that we get asked all the time to me at nauseum is, is Christianity a white man's religion? Mm -hmm. To the point that I'm, I'm just tired of answering it. I just, I just refer the book because if you want, if you, if you want to read the book, then I'll talk with you, <laughs> but I'm, I'm just tired of answering this question now. Sometimes since actually even yesterday, I get sincere questions from people who are they're getting this told to them. They were already confirmed Christians, but now different groups are kind of like Hebrew Israelites or other groups are creeping in to say this to them, to draw them away. And because that's not really always talked about, especially at predominantly white institutions, because that's not an issue for, for them. Mm -hmm. And so I really appreciate you and, and Glenn doing this because one of the things um, that, I don't know if it's you or him that quotes uh, Dr. Mbiti, who said that Christianity had spread so far in North Africa by the second century that it was considered an, ind an indigenous African religion. And this is long before it hits, you know, England or Norway or anywhere else. And and so there's no half, way. Half a millennium before Muhammad. <laughs> half a millennium before Muhammad. So there's just, if anybody does any, not you don't have to do, even do a lot of research, just some research. That 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 claim goes away pretty quickly. The first Gentile Christian, Acts eight twenty seven to yeah. thirty, was from uh, the Empire of Maroe, and we know that because the queen's name was the her title was the Kendaka, which was a, a title for that uh, the, the queen mother or the queen regnant. There's a debate, uh, probably probably just the queen mother. Um, for an empire that had been in Nubia from around 750 BC onward. And then around 333, you have Aksum in East Africa converting to Christianity through the witness of a couple of Syrian Christians. No Europeans involved in that. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, about the same time the Roman Empire becomes, uh, Christianity becomes legal in the Roman Empire is pretty close to the time that East Africa becomes Christian, mm. part of East Africa becomes Christian. Yeah, so I appreciate that insight. And so there was another, I'm gonna read this quote um, in that book. And I don't know, like I said, which of you two wrote this. Uh, it says, many professors at liberal elite universities today regard faith and reason as incompatible, um, unaware of how thoroughly their own views have been shaped by certain philosophical fashions now prevalent in Western intellectualism most have never given the evidence for the gospel of fair hearing. So one of the things I do talk a lot about is the logical inconsistencies, especially in naturalistic theory um, to me. And, and you know, I'm debating the PhD, but if I do, 
I'm going to kind of continue what I did for my master's, the first part of my master's thesis of the, the gaps in the epistemic kind of chain of how you get to those conclusions. They kind of assume certain things, but you can't really justify it. Like you said at the beginning, there's no meaning. There's no, now you can pretend like there is, but you can't justify it from that worldview. So in that same vein, in your work on miracles and on the, the reliability of the gospels, what are some aspects or concepts that these liberal professors um, or any professor may not be giving full weight in your opinion? Yeah. <clears throat> There's actually a number, a number of issues. I mean, um, the when you have people denying the historical reality of Jesus, mm -hmm. you know, th that has nothing. To, Does that still happen at the university level? Uh, well, not among not among New Testament okay. scholars normally, but uh, and not usually among historians. But the you have people. I mean, I can see. I, I used to be an atheist, but being an atheist doesn't mean you have to deny the historical existence of Jesus any more than you have to deny the his, historical existence of of Muhammad, or for that matter, well. Since I don't believe in it, I deny the historical existence of the Bible. In fact, I deny the historical existence of you Christians. You don't exist. I mean, <laughs> it's silly. Anyway, but uh, so so these are there are separate issues, separate questions that you know deserve separate answers. But let me let me deal with it in terms of my specialization, my my own area. Well, I also could talk about David Hume on miracles, uh, but. In terms of the historical reliability of the Gospels, people will sometimes nitpick and they'll say, okay, well, look, this doesn't fit with this. And the kind of stuff they're doing, it's nitpicking. I mean, you read any ancient historian and you compare them with other ancient historians from the period, you're going to have those kind of differences. It doesn't mean it's not history. It doesn't mean that that we can't use it for historical reconstruction. Historians do, do that all the time. We just take into account okay, this is how they wrote history then, you know, these are the, if you read enough ancient historiography, you get you get familiar with that. But you, you put it in the other direction. You say, okay, what do we have that we have multiple corroboration for? Or what do we have where we can check it against the, the other evidence and it matches? I mean, there's, we've got so much of that for the gospels. And in terms of, yeah, well, I could go on in that. Maybe I should skip to Hume now. Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, okay. So with with regard to um, the argument against against uh, miracles, where you can't even get get off base one because some people will say, wow, you believe in miracles, and they, they just want to dismiss what you're saying. They don't they didn't even want to look at any evidence for it. Uh, and then they call you closed-minded. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they they often start with, and they, they don't even all know that they're starting with with David Hume. But yeah, uh, well, actually, David, David Hume's essay on on miracles. Yeah, I don't have that one on the shelf, but yeah, <laughs> it, it's not one of his better works. It's it's been soundly critiqued by all sorts of ph philosophic publications. I mean, uh, Richard Swinburne from Oxford was critiquing it a long time ago. And now there's a whole chorus. There are public publications from Cambridge, Oxford, Cornell, and so on. Just the one from, from uh, Oxford, John Ehrman, his book is called Hume's Abject Failure, his essay on miracles. And somebody criticized the author of this book saying, well, you just don't like his argument because you're a Christian, to which he responded, actually, I'm not really a Christian in any traditional sense. I just thought it was a bad argument. Yeah. So uh, philosophically, I mean, it's it's entirely circular. Like uniform human experience is, you know, rules out any reason to, to believe in miracles. So what happens when you have eyewitness claims for miracles? Well, you know, uniform human experience pre Poses us not to accept that. There was a 2006 Pew Forum survey that was done of Pentecostals and Charismatics in 10 countries. And the total number, uh, when, when you extrapolate from the percentages, the total number of Pentecostals and Charismatics who claimed to 
have witnessed divine healing in those 10 countries alone comes out to somewhere around 200 million. But if you don't like Pentecostals or Charismatics, um, the, the survey also is a, is a control group talked about other Christians. So those who didn't self-identify as Pentecostals or actually it was just Protestant Charismatics and 39% of those claim to have witnessed divine healing. Oh. Nobody would say that all of those were actually miracles. Certainly nobody would say that the only way to explain all of those was uh, direct divine action. But having said that, you can't start with the premise that uniform human experience excludes it when you have hundreds of millions of people claiming a contrary experience. You at least ought to look at some of the evidence. Yeah. And you know, some of the evidence should be dismissed, but you have to look at it first. But then some of the evidence is, is really strong. I mean, we have stuff even since my, since my uh, two volume work on miracles came out, there have been a, a number of um, further publications in medical journals of, of case studies of um, uh, one was one was of a woman who was blind for 12 years and uh, they, they they, they weren't Pentecostal or charismatic. They weren't even familiar with some of those things. And the, the husband just, that night he just felt led to pray for her. He prayed for her. Her sight was suddenly restored after 12 years. Wow. It was it was due to something that was incurable. Uh, it was or, organic. And, you know, she could, uh, she could see after that. It's medically documented. It's been written up in the medical journal. She's She's retained her sight for decades now. And, you know, there are a number of other cases like that. And they happen to coincide with, with prayer in the name of Jesus. So, I mean, it's, it's a big subject. There's a lot more yeah. that, that could be said. But just to say, when people just presuppose that these things can't happen, that's, yeah. uh, that's not being open-minded. Not at all. And, and, you know, one thing I always kind of try to do is take take people a step back and saying that, okay, if naturalism is true, if I can point out one aspect that supersedes naturalism, then that that part of that theory has to fall apart, regardless. Forget Christianity for a second. Mm -hmm. But if if all that exists is natural, then you're saying there's no metaphysical realities, there's no supernatural realities. But if I can show one, then that whole paradigm falls apart. And so even something as simple as, well, I guess it's not that simple, but are we just a brain or do we have a mind? But once you posit, or once you, a naturalist even, once they posit that it's just the brain, but you've exit, you've, you've superseded your own theory at that point, because now you're, you're making a metaphysical notion, or if you want to say it's just blind determinism, then why should I believe you anyway? You know, it's like, a, it's a, it's a catch 22. Why, on why does side. anything matter? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that that part, yeah, I, I I agree with you. If it's just matter, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I'm stealing that. <laughs> um. So you know, we briefly brought up Ermin. I really don't want to get into Ermin. We'll, we'll we'll skip that. Um. Let Let me ask this. Um. Why is it important to understand biblical genealogies? And just for clarification, I'm talking about how genealogies are recorded in the Old Testament versus the New Testament. Yeah. Well, actually, in both of them, they could skip generations. I mean, if you compare Matthew and Luke, they have way different number of generations in there because Matthew skips a bunch. Um, and in the Old Testament, of course, they could skip a lot of generations too. I mean, it's it's a sample and actually anthropologists have documented that in a lot of cultures where you have uh, the nearer generations and then you have the early, you know, epic ones that, that they get preserved, but a lot of the ones in between fall out. In, in the Old Testament, well, in Genesis, you have a number of places where it says the book of the generations of, and then it lists the descendants of the person. Did we lose you? Uh, oh, there I we think go. I'm back. Okay. Okay. Could uh, how how long were, were we gone? 
You said uh, we lose the descendants of a person. Uh, okay, so in in Genesis, it, it goes on to list the descendants of the person who depend on their ancestor for their identity. In Matthew chapter one, verse one, you have the same formula: the book of the generations of mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. But then it it goes on to say uh, to list not his uh, not his descendants, but his ancestors. Because even Jesus' ancestors descend on, uh, depend on him for their meaning. Their their purpose in history was was what it was leading towards. No, oh. no, yeah, I appreciate that. So you're saying Old Testament, we're looking forward, and, and New Testament, we're looking back. But the 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 hinge point is is Jesus. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Which as it should be. Um, so I want to I want to close with this final section on on mission, and this is we kind of talked a little bit at the beginning about even how you were impacted by not all but some Christians, and and you didn't understand how this belief they said they had didn't kind of impact everything about them, and we talked about orthopraxy, um, and so there's still some um, present day controversy. We'll do another controversial topic here real quick. Uh, with women in ministry and if they're allowed to have a role and and what should that role be and you've written about this you've spoken about this and can you kind of help us i know it's it's a big topic in a little bit of time but kind of make sense of the nuances involved in this uh debate if it is one so for example today i was even reading philippians um, i'm going through philippians on my own right now and rereading that in philippians 4 and 3 paul talks about aodia and and Sintich. Um, who were side by side with him in ministry. Uh, we can think about Phoebe and Priscilla and, and you know, the, the, the first evangelist in the Bible, the Samaritan woman. Um, mm -hmm. So I was having a conversation with somebody. So correct me if I'm thinking about this wrong, that basically because we today are more hung up on titles where Paul told Timothy to do the work of an evangelist, but he was never evangelist Timothy. Right. Um, so because of that in our present context, it's easier to put this hierarchy. But at the at the at the at the onset of Christianity, it was just about the work. Mm -hmm. And so I think it made it easier for them, men and women, to share in what needed to be done. Is that fair to say? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And this is such a such a big topic. Uh, by the way, regarding titles. Uh, there's a book I keep planning to read. I have it here when I get to it, but um, I don't know I if this is going to come out backwards or forwards in the screen. I'm trying to. Oh, oh it's coming up forwards. Okay, yep. screen is backwards. Okay. But it's it's a book published by uh, Johns Hopkins on ordained women in the early church, and and just going through all the inscriptions and so on. For actually, they did have deacons and elders for a few centuries okay. in the early church before it became you know completely male controlled. Mm. Um, but uh, working, well, before I go to the New Testament, just in terms of apologetics, this was one of the big issues when I was a, a doctoral student at Duke. Hmm. They, most people on the ground at Duke were less concerned about the historical reliability of the Gospels than they, than they were saying Christianity is racist, sexist, and imperialist. Hmm. And so um, that's an apologetics issue. To, mm -hmm. to address that um, when people when people say things like that and in terms of the way many Christians have behaved, many Christians have been racist, sexist, and imperialist, uh, yeah. or at least one or two of the above. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that's not what the way Jesus is. Mm -hmm. And Christianity doesn't rise or fall on the way certain Christians have behaved, it rises or falls on Jesus and, and his earliest followers who communicated his message. So, I mean, in the Bible, we do have prophetesses as, 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 well, as, as well as prophets. Uh, prophecy, prophets, that was the, if you take the whole Bible together, that was the most common ministry that's mentioned in the Bible. Uh, and you do have women doing that. When you come to the New Testament, some people say, well, Jesus didn't have any of the 12 who were, who were women. You know, he was 
he was radical. He broke some some ground in his culture, but that would have been. <laughs> I mean, it was bad enough. He had women among the disciples following the group. Mm -hmm. That was enough from what we read about Josephus about, you know, the Pharisees a couple centuries before got blasted because they had women even supporting them. Mm. So, but, but Jesus, uh, you know, that, that was, that, that would have gone too far. But um, by the same token, if we're going to say that because of that, all ministers have to be male, we ought to be consistent and say that all ministers have to be Jewish. Mm. I mean, it's not it's not an argument that really works all that well. But when you come to Paul's letters, which is where the, the big debate on that is, I mean, you've got two passages, 1 Corinthians 14, mm. verses 34 and 35, and there are a number of explanations to that. And to be concise, I'll just give you my own. Um, but... And in, in also 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses especially uh, 11 and 12. And again, to be concise, I'll just give you my own. But again, there's a bunch of takes on that. For 1 Corinthians 14, Paul <clears throat> wants the women to be silent in church. Now, I don't know. Does your church allow women to sing? Yeah. Only men can sing. Nope. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> well, see, they're not following that because it says women have to be silent, right? So mm -hmm. I mean, most churches today don't follow it to mean all that it possibly could mean. So the question is, what specifically did it mean if it doesn't mean all that it could possibly mean? And what he specifies there, he says, if, if, if they want to learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. Why would he bring up that? It was common in ancient lecture settings, Greek, Roman, Jewish, across the board, to interrupt with questions. Now, why would it be a problem for the women to ask questions and not the men? Well, here, I'll give you two, two approaches, uh, both of which may, may play a part. One would have been the cultural conventions in that you know, he's very concerned about the witness of the church. Today, of course, the witness of the church would would be the other direction if you if you, you know, silence women across the board. Oh, right. most most of our churches we don't have anybody asking questions during the sermon. But um, in First Corinthians fourteen, apparently the the women were asking questions. It was considered inappropriate in many of the more conservative circles in the certainly the Greek world, and still in some circles among Romans. Uh, and some Jewish circles, for a woman to speak in front of other women's husbands. So you've got a mixed group there. Um, they're not meeting in a synagogue at this point. They've been kicked out of the synagogue. They're meeting in homes. There's no way to segregate the men from the women, so they're all together. But also, an another point is that Jewish Jewish boys were were raised reciting the Torah. The girls were not. They could hear Torah in the synagogues. Uh, there's a case from the late second century where you have a the daughter of a rabbi, the wife of a rabbi, and she she knew a lot of uh, rabbinic type stuff. But for the most part, women didn't have the same access. Uh, that in, in in terms of other kinds of education, that was that was true as well in the in the Greek and the Roman world. I mean, you had a few exceptions, but you could. If you take the ones that we that we know of, and then the men that we know of, we're talking about maybe one percent uh, who who could actually be teachers or something like that. So, <clears throat> keeping in mind that background, um, but but what's more dramatic is not that Paul wants them to learn quietly because that was the appropriate way for novices to learn. It's that he wants them to learn. Let them ask their husbands at home. Now, Plutarch was one of the more progressive writers regarding gender and antiquity. And Plutarch says that if a, uh, well, he, he instructs the young man to whom he's writing, Pollyannis, he says, take an interest in your wife's learning. That's That was very progressive in his day. And then he spoils it, he says, for if left to themselves, women produce nothing but base passions and folly. Paul doesn't spoil it, you know, Paul just says, you know, he, he encourages the husbands to take an interest in their wives' learning. 
Greek men were on average 12 years older than their wives and often viewed them as children. And I could go into a lot of the other, other background, but I need to move on to, um, oh, oh, something else I need to say before I move on. First Corinthians 14 comes in the same letter. This is going to sound surprising. It's 1 Corinthians 11. <laughs> in 1 Corinthians 11, women are allowed to pray and prophesy, provided their heads are covered. That's another cultural background issue that would take a digression. But if they can pray and prophesy, obviously, what are they doing? Lip syncing? I mean, if they're <laughs> going to pray and prophesy, they have to do it out loud. Yeah. And so Paul is not against them praying or prophesying, prophesying, speaking the word of the Lord. But in terms of the uh, explanation from scripture, they're not in a position to be able to give that. And Paul isn't even talking about explanation there. He's talking about not answering questions. He's talking about asking questions. But then you come to uh, 1 Timothy 2. And sometimes people have read that into 1 Corinthians 14, but you know the Corinthians obviously couldn't flip over to 1 Timothy 2 uh, right. since it wasn't written to them and it was written after <laughs> 1 Corinthians. But in 1 Timothy 2, gives instructions to men, then he gives instructions to women. And one of the instructions he gives is that women should not, uh, oh boy, there's a, there's a debate over how to translate it. Women should not uh, usurp authority uh, is, is one way to translate it. Obviously men shouldn't do that either. Mm -hmm. uh, another way to translate it is have authority. Then there's a debate as to whether it's saying women shouldn't teach in such a way as to have authority or whether it's just saying women shouldn't teach or have authority. If So I'm going to take the, just, just to take the, for the sake of argument, take the strictest position. Women aren't to teach or to have authority over men. If we, if we take that, the question is, is that a transcultural requirement or is that for a specific situation? After all, Timothy has been with Paul a lot. And if it's uh, if it's a universal rule, Timothy ought to already know it. But, uh, but what he says is, uh, let a woman uh, not, not, not do this, but rather let her learn quietly and submissively. Yeah, oh, I, I like that. They just said authentine. That's that's the word. I was <laughs> I was trying not to not to quote the Greek. So, I, but yeah, since it's there, that's that's the word. It's really a debated word because we don't have, I think, any examples of that verb that have survived from before the time of Paul. So it's it's a huge debate, and I don't think it's going to be easily solved with with word studies. Um. We do have the noun before anyway. Anyway, uh, yeah. See, I'm I'm ADHD, <laughs> and so I've got I've got a hundred things running through my mind at once, and and trying to keep on track. I'm I'm probably boring you with my huh? all my all my digressions, but in in when he says let let them learn quietly and submissively, that was the appropriate way for novices to learn was quietly and submissively. He's already told the, the whole of the church earlier in the same chapter that we want to live a quiet and, and peaceable life. But in particular, the situation that we know of in First and Second Timothy, false teachers were targeting women in the church. So First Timothy 5.13 talks about the um, women, uh, younger widows going from house to house, carrying... Uh, the word that's often translated busybodies normally means spreaders of nonsense. Mm. And in philosophic contexts can mean spreaders of false teaching. Well, in, in 2 Timothy, addressing the same congregation, 2 Timothy 3, verse 6, it says that uh, the false teachers are worming their way into households, leading astray weak-willed women. So here we have a, a church where the false teachers are targeting women. Is it a coincidence where the one place in the Bible where we know that the false teachers are targeting women is also the one place in the Bible that seems to prohibit women from teaching the Bible? 
Mm. It seems to me that those two things have something to do with each other. Mm. And it, it has to do with the local situation. And why would the false teachers target women? Well, again, with the women being being less educated is, is one thing um, that, that we already um, mentioned, and especially educated in the law, um, more of the people who knew the, the law and could teach it well would be adults, uh, adult, uh, sorry, would be adult men. Mm. Um, I'm, right now I'm thinking of First Timothy chapter one, where uh, they're speaking of, of the law and these people are speaking of things they don't know anything about. And also targeting widows, because not only was there not a man there, but also the churches met in homes and widows were the women who most often owned their own homes. So you got a house church right, right, right there, right available. Yeah. And you, um, Paul does make an argument. Uh, he makes two, he, two brief arguments after that. One is man was created first and then, and then woman. And the other, but that's the exact same argument he uses for head coverings. One, one of his arguments for head coverings in 1 Corinthians 11. Yeah. And then also he says that um, Eve was the one deceived and not Adam. Now that would exclude all women from teaching in all cultures, as opposed to just locally, if that's a universal argument. But Paul sometimes makes, un well, usually he makes universal arguments, but sometimes he makes local arguments. And so to, to that point with this question, with, 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 this is kind of the same question that you're answering. Is that right? Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. As to whether it's for, because all scriptures for all time, but not all scriptures for all circumstances. And mm. so we make sure we apply it to, to analogous circumstances. When um, Paul elsewhere uses Eve, uh, he, he uses it uh speaks of Eve twice in his writings. One is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 for head coverings. And the other, he's speaking of Eve being deceived. There it's in 2 Corinthians 11, I think around verse two or three. And in that context, he's not speaking just to the women. He's speaking to all the Corinthian believers. So in other words, Paul can use that in different ways in different settings. And we have a bunch of other passages some of which you mentioned at the beginning, you know, Philippians 4, Romans 16. In Romans 16, he commends more women for their ministry than he commends men. And you've got a woman apostle in Romans 16, 7. You've got... His, his main benefactor, right? That's the one with the money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, and then Paul, Paul does not use the, the label pastor with any woman's name but neither does he use it with any man's name. The, the two terms that Paul uses most often for his fellow workers in ministry are synergos, fellow worker, and diakonos, or minister. And he uses the latter for Phoebe, uses the former for Priscilla, along with her, right, her, her, her husband, Aquila. Um, so Paul, Paul does affirm women in ministry. He does... Uh, I mean, individual women. He does allow women to prophesy. I mean, he does have a a, a woman who's an, who's an apostle mm -hmm. in in, uh, in Romans sixteen seven. And what's surprising is how many there are, given the prejudices of the culture. But mm. you notice the places where he especially uh, affirms women in ministry. It's in Philippi, and in Rome. Mm. Those were the two of the most gender progressive uh, places in the Roman Empire. So the places where women had more freedom, they were mm. more likely to be more involved directly in ministry. Yeah. That, so that surprises. If, yeah. if we allow more freedoms today, chances are we'll, we'll have more women uh, involved in ministry today too. I mean, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. We need all the, all the workers we can get. Well, one more question on this topic, then we'll move on. Um, do you do you make a distinction? Uh, I don't know if you can see women in ministry and women serving as presbyteroi. Um, no, because again, Paul doesn't name a specific woman as a 
as a pastor, but neither does he name a specific man as a pastor. And if he's got women as apostles and women as prophets, why, why not? I mean, Deborah was a judge over all of Israel. Why couldn't a woman be part of the leadership team? Because a lot of the churches probably had a plurality of elders. Why couldn't she be part of the leadership team of a house church that's got maybe 20 to 40 members? Mm -hmm. And I and I, I co-pastor a house church. And, and one of the beautiful things is um, not just in the leadership, because it, it is really me and my, my friend um, Nick who lead and teach and everything like that. But we all engage in, you know, dissecting and, and exegeting the word every Sunday where one of us kind of leads. But as you said, everybody like the Acts chapter two church, everybody gets to talk. And that was kind of one of the reasons we did it in the first place. So and we all benefit from from those perspectives because I don't think anybody has a monopoly on 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 revelation. Um, so just a couple more questions. Um, so one thing, one thing, like I said, I used to teach on almost exclusively was the kingdom. And that's not that I don't anymore, but Jesus taught the kingdom of God um, that he says, that's why I came in Matthew four and Luke four. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one of the passages in Matthew 16, he talks about, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. And I've heard a lot of misteaching on that um, as though it's an actual key. But anyway, can you expound on how you would explain Jesus's kingdom in general and our role as kingdom citizens. <clears throat> when Jesus came preaching the kingdom, it fits into what the Old Testament prophets had promised. They talked about the restoration of God's people. So they're looking at the at the restoration of, of Israel and, and so on. And they're, they're, uh, one way of speaking of that was of God's kingdom and the good news of God, about God's kingdom. So Isaiah 52, 7, how blessed, or how beautiful on the, on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. It's good news of salvation, good news of peace, good news, our God reigns. And, and that was to be expressed in the restoration of God's people and ultimately new heavens and the new earth, you know, the, the whole restoration. Jesus comes preaching the kingdom and he talks about a secret of the kingdom or the mystery of the kingdom. There's going to be this restoration, but what people didn't understand because they weren't ready to understand yet, uh, because it would get him crucified before he had time to finish discipling his disciples, mm -hmm. that when Jesus is preaching the kingdom, he's preaching also the gospel that we're preaching today in its non-hidden form, the good news of Jesus Christ, the good news that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the King. Mm. The good news of the kingdom, you can't have a kingdom without a king. And <laughs> Jesus is the king. Yeah. So th that part is kind of a secret going, going forward, um, Jesus' kingship. And you take the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, it talks a lot about the kingdom. And then you get to the final chapters of the Gospel of Mark and all the king language has to do with Jesus being crowned with thorns as king of the Jews. The kingdom had to come through the cross. Wow. And, and, and that would be at the first coming. And a lot of people weren't ready to hear that. Just like a lot of people don't want to hear that today. You know, they want everything to be triumph, glory. Well, <laughs> we're looking for triumph and glory, but those who suffer with them will reign with them. There's going to be some of that along the way. Um, in terms of the keys of the kingdom, back then, uh, you know, the keys of a palace, they weren't like little keys like, like this. Uh, they, were, they were so big, you had to have a major domo. Uh, his, his, his office was, his role was, he was supposed to carry the key around with him because it was so big. But for uh, Peter, the context in which he said that he'll have the keys of the kingdom is the context in which he confesses Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. Right. And the point is, it's Peter as confessor. He, he lets people in, as opposed to Matthew chapter 23, where the scribes and the Pharisees are using their teaching and shutting people out of the kingdom. Mm. Peter is to open the doors, welcome people in. How? Preaching Jesus as the Christ 
the king. Mm-hmm. That's the good news of the of the kingdom. And it is very good news. Um, yes. yes, I appreciate that. And so for anybody that's joining late, obviously, I, I believe you already know who Dr. Kina is. He's written so much on so many topics. Um, so we're, we're just we're just kind of scratching the surface on a lot of these things. But I did want to ask him some of these pointed questions since, you know, we have him here. And so I, I have one final one. This one requires a bit of setup. Um, so I was doing a, one of my, I think it was my, I don't remember which class, um, either Old Test history of apologetics, Old Testament or New Testament, I can't remember, but I was doing an exe- exegetical research paper and oh, it must have been New Testament, I guess, because I was, I was um, dissecting Galatians 5, 1 through 12. And you've done two commentaries on Galatians, is that right? Yeah, I I wasn't able to stay within the page count, so the publisher <laughs> graciously allowed me to write a larger one. <laughs> okay, well, that was good. We benefited. Um, but I had referenced your, your commentaries quite a bit, and I think there's a lot of cultural understanding and navigation techniques that we can gain from Galatians and from, obviously, the gospel as, as a whole that, com- you know, what the gospel compels us to do as well as what happens if we if we don't apply or misapply those concepts. And so in one part, you broke down the culture of the Galatians. You wrote Romans depicted the Roman conquest of these Asian Galatians as liberating. I'm sorry, as liberating as liberating Asia from the Galatians lawlessness. Writing in the first century BCE, Cicero considered the Gauls less civilized than residents of the province of Asia. Outsiders stereotyped Galatians as ignorant, although Galatians themselves worked hard to challenge this prejudice. And so perhaps the Judaizers saw the Galatian people as weak or ignorant or immoral or some combination of those attributes, and in turn sought to um, assure their holiness by implementing some of their Jewish customs. And that's why you know, they, they want to force them to get circumcised and you know, put these Judaizing things on them. And so because of that class of cultures, Paul obviously writes the letter of Galatians to kind of set things straight and put set things straight and, and make it clear that Jesus is the king. And that's that's what you need to focus, kind of like what you just said. Now, referencing another. So I don't know which commentary is which, but in another commentary, also on Galatians, you, you translated the term um, to live like Jews. I, don't, I might be saying it wrong. Iodizing. Um, what applies to adopting Jewish customs or lifestyle. And the term can apply simply to Jewish sympathizers who selectively adopted some Jewish customs, but it could also go further. Uh, So the Greek version of Esther 8.17 declares that many Gentiles were circumcised and Judaized because they feared the Jews. And likewise, a Gentile soldier agreed to Judaize to the point of circumcision to save his life. So in these last two examples, fear of the the Jewish fighters, rather than personal conviction, compelled their circumcision. So here's where I want to go. Um, the Judaizers were attempting to gain allegiance to their system. And today, in many ways, this is still happening, although it's not about circumcision and um, those types of things. Some parts of the Christian church, <laughs> we'll say some parts of the Christian church, want everyone else to align with their priorities and do things their way, but without true acceptance of those, Mm -hmm. um, they are mandating to align with such a way, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, so you want me to do what you want me to do, but you're really not even acknowledging me as a, as a valid member unless I do it. So my question then is what can Galatians and really the new Testament, as a whole, teach us about the dangers of those types of propositions that lead to racism or lead to covert, really, um, racism. Because I think the overt, I think most people are, most Christians, I hope, are like they would push back at least today on that. But it's more covert, and it's the things that you said when you when you talked and you were in those circles. You were surprised to hear that this was common because that stuff doesn't make the news. I always tell people if we can't agree on the overt. We'll never agree on the covert, the stuff that only I know, because it, it wasn't egregious enough. Obviously, I'm alive. I didn't die in this situation. So, but it happened. And so what it, what can Galatians kind of help us unpack as far as the dangers of being Judaizers today uh, in the church and um, 
how to navigate these cultural you know, nuances. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, yeah, and this is a really important one. A lot of the issues that we've talked about, like about women in ministry, or um, what were some of the other ones we talked Divorce about? Divorce. <laughs> some, some, some of the issues we talked about, I mean, you, you've got good Jesus-loving Christians on both sides, you know, eschatology, things like that. We, you know, we can, but this one, Paul was pretty clear as a matter of the gospel. I was involved with a Messianic Jewish congregation a few decades ago, and the uh, some people, some, some Gentile churches outside complained about the congregation because believers were dancing the hora, they were dancing Jewish dances, and they were practicing Jewish customs and so on. And I was like, okay, let me get this straight. And, and they were and they were citing Galatians, some of them. So let me get this straight. You're saying that people must follow your culture, your Gentile culture, uh, because of Galatians, and you're going to impose that on people as a condition of truly following Jesus. And uh, as long as uh, you, you're you're going to make that a rule, so you're going to practice legalism, and legalism is okay as long as it's not obeying something that is in the Bible. <laughs> so, so you're not allowed to obey the law, but you can. But church rules, we have to obey those. So anyway, um, the problem in Galatia. Well, I mean the. You have the immediate problem in Galatia, of course. You know, we're talking about the, the Judaizers, those who wanted to enforce um, Jewish customs and say, and you could see where they were coming from, but they were missing the radical mm. nature of the Spirit of God having circumcised us inwardly and so on, that that, that the age to come is broken into history and, and, and so on. Uh, but the, the basic problem in Galatia, uh, in, a, in, a, in a broader context, is you have people coming and imposing their own culture, mixing it up with the gospel, and then imposing that as, as a requirement to, to be you know, real Christians. In missions history, we've had people who, who did it right, who really tried to identify with the history, you know, with the cultures that they were going to. And then we have people who come in, again, mixing up their culture with the gospel and imposing that on people and often causing all sorts of difficulties. Um, some, some cultures where the only women who covered their breasts were adulteresses. And so the missionaries make the Christian women cover their breasts, you know, and what does that say about Christianity and that culture? You know, it's just making all, a mess so much in, in places going in where... But we do that often in our churches today. And sometimes we, we can risk doing that when people think that you know their church culture is the church culture. So if it's a if it's a predominantly white church, oh we want we want black people to come to our church. We want uh, people from these other cultures to come to our church. We welcome them. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's our culture. We're running the show. Mm. That's um, that 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 that's missing the way that's missing the. Um, we 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 need we need to welcome one another with the cultures and. Mm -hmm. It's not just uh, doing what the circumcisionists were doing in Galatia if we have a flint knife and circumcise people. Wow. It, it, man, wow. <laughs> this is, um, yeah, it's really, it's a really deep topic. Um, I know, and I appreciate your insights. Um, and I appreciate the insights from the perspective you come from, because obviously you live this um, kind of embedded in in the culture, you know? So I, I'm i done. If there's anyone else that has a final question, because I know we went a little over time, um, 
but wow, I really appreciate your heartfelt words and whew, this one, this one was a, we went to some deep zones tonight. So <laughs> I hope everybody enjoyed it. I hope um, you learned it. Hope you can share this with somebody. And, and even if you don't agree with every perspective, at least, you know, take time and do some research and, and investigate a little deeper, especially on, on, on sticky topics like women and ministry and divorce. These are not as cut and dry as, and, that, and that's kind of the other part with the Judaizers of today. I won't name names. I'm, I'm going to try to be nice. But when you come out as a pastor of a large church, we'll say that, and you're so dogmatic on one direction of looking at this and completely discounting scholars such as yourself and other scholars who who do see the nuance, even if you don't agree for you to tweet that or, or just say it and and leave it there, where now people you don't know are being hurt because they're not going to be able to understand the nuances and all they're hearing is that I'm a sinner or I don't belong or, you know, they, they, that's all they hear. And so um, we, we, I say this as a pastor, I say this as um, somebody who served in ministry for a long time. Um, we have to be careful with our words. <laughs> we have to steward our words well. And uh, so I hope tonight provided some insight, some nuance and um, some, some food for thought, if nothing else. The, the bottom line in Christian ethics is loving one another. We don't always have to agree on everything, but unity isn't just agreeing on every on every detail. Unity is we love one another, we bear with one another, we forgive one another, and we work together for the gospel. Couldn't say it better. And on that, we shall end. Thank you, Dr. Keener, for, for joining us. Um, I know people in the comments are really blessed, and people who share this later will be blessed. And so I'm blessed. Uh, if nothing else, I thank you. I appreciate it. And keep doing the amazing work that you do. God bless. God bless you. Thank you so much.